so I think um, we can make a start. Uh, so it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Mr. Nick Riley, uh, who uh, works uh, at the Oxford University Hospitals Trust, um, which is our local bone infection unit. And Nick and his colleagues have uh, huge experience in managing bone infection. Uh, and in fact, have uh, written one of the protocols that we use uh, for diagnosing uh, infection uh, in orthopedic surgery. Um, uh, so welcome, Nick. Um, I will, uh, and uh, welcome Pierre Luigi, of course, as always. Um, I will uh, pass to Andre uh, to, uh, uh, to do uh, his bit in Ukrainian. Uh, before we uh, open uh, this evening's webinar. Andre. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Доброго вечора, шановні колеги. Раді вас бачити на вже 22-му вебінарі, який ми проводимо сумісно з ФЕШ, Федерації Європейських Асоціацій Хірургів Кісті та BSSH, Британським товариством хірургії кісті. А, і сьогоднішній наш вебінар буде присвячений введенню а, інфекції, кістової інфекції кісті та зап'ястку. Лектор Ніколас Рейлі, він працює в е, університетській клініці Оксфорда, в е, клініці, яка займається безпосередньо кістковою інфекцією. І, власне, його е, Поле інтересів – це є кіскова інфекція кісті та зап'ястку. Прошу вас бути активними, як завжди, задавати багато запитань. Як тільки у вас виникає запитання, пишіть їх в чат або користуйтесь формою Q&A. Можете писати українською мовою, ми, я їх перекладу і за необхідності можу потім перекласти і відповідь. Тож, будь ласка, будьте активні, і ми будемо розпочинати. So, um, we can start, I think. Uh, I think. So, uh, please be active, ask questions. You can write question in the chat box or uh, you use uh, Q&A box to ask the questions. And uh, after the lecture, I think Nicholas will gladly answer it. Uh, so, uh, Nikos, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Fesh and uh, Jonathan for asking me to uh, give this webinar uh, this evening on how to manage bone infection of the hand and wrist. Um, I have consulting agreements with Acumed and Arthrex. Um, I'm not convinced they're relevant to this, but I'll disclose them nonetheless. We'll, we'll start off by talking about why hand and wrist infection, why particularly hand and wrist bone infection is, uh, is important. We'll talk through the diagnostic criteria, we'll talk through the classification that's available, and mainly concentrate on the principles of how to manage these potentially difficult cases well. And then we'll talk through a couple of cases at the end and hopefully demonstrate how by following these principles, we're able to achieve a successful surgery for patients. So hand and wrist infection is important, primarily because it's common. Our hands are on show to the world. We communicate with the world through them. So they're liable to be cut, they're liable to be bitten. And as a result, they're predisposed to getting infections. We see a huge spectrum at presentation from the simple things that just need a little wash and no antibiotics to difficult problems that potentially need multiple surgeries. There are cost implications, not just for patients themselves, but for nations. If uh, patients are taking time away from work, this affects their productivity. And sometimes for the more difficult to treat problems, there's significant problems in the future for patients who lose digits. Why is bone infection important? So this is a quality of life score. So the bone infection unit in Oxford undertook quality of life scores on all the patients who are referred to them with bone infection. And what you can see is, is that osteomyelitis of the upper limb patients have the worst quality of life than patients who have who've had a stroke or who've had lung cancer or who have um, colon cancer. 
So we can see that this bone infection significantly affects patients' quality of life. So how do we diagnose it? It's really important to remember that osteomyelitis is a huge spectrum. It can be very acute, it can be very chronic and indolent. And we need to think about the differing clinical signs that these patients can present with. We need to think about the local signs, but also the systemic signs. And the acute and chronic patients have very different clinical pictures. The acute patients tend to present with red, hot, swollen limbs and tend to be unwell. The chronic patients can be much more subtle, maybe just some weight loss and feeling not too well, and often have very small puncture with only a very minimal amount of ooze. And this is being on for a long time. Blood tests in these patients are of limited value. We know that patients with chronic disease can have almost normal CRP and ESRs. And those patients who are having acute problems, we find that the CRP can often lag behind the clinical picture. But the take home message here is that if you see a febrile patient, take blood cultures, because this can be an important diagnostic tool. When it comes to imaging, the radiograph remains the uh, first port of call. For the first two to three days, plain radiographs can be normal, but at a week, we can start to see things such as osteopenia, bone destruction, breaches in the cortices, and periosteal reaction. At around 10 days, we can start to see sequestra forming, and sometimes the bones can be generally osteopenic due to the disease. MRI remains the most sensitive test as regards imaging to diagnose osteomyelitis. The images uh, on the right demonstrate a patient of mine with a, a chronic thumb paronychia that had developed into osteomyelitis of the distal phalanx. The reason that I got the MRI scan was to demonstrate that there was no osteomyelitis in the proximal phalanx so that I knew I didn't need to debride this, but also to check the tendons and make sure that there was no potential infection in there. It's important to remember that sometimes MRI scanning can overestimate the amount of osteomyelitis that's present because normal bone edema surrounding the infection can light up on an MRI scan. Generally, osteomyelitis is classified using the Cernia Mada classification. And there's two parts to the classification, types A, B, and C. These are, these are relevant to how the patient is, host factors, whether they have normal physiology or whether they either have systemic or localized immunocompromised issues. The type C host is often very unwell and the treatment of the bone infection is often worse than living with the disease. We then look at the anatomical site. Type one has a uh, periosteal uh, uh, intramedullary component to the uh, infection. Type two is a cortical infection. Type three is both medullary and cortical, and then type four is widespread, involving large areas of the bone. Whilst the Cerniumada classification is useful in the, in the long bones, it's a, it's a little use in the hand. It's difficult to apply this classification to the smaller bones that we deal with. So how do we look after patients with osteomyelitis? Well, we take a history, we examine patients, and we investigate them appropriately. Saying the things that we want to know are occupation. How do they want their hands to function once they've been treated? We've looked at host factors in that Cernimada classification, but important things are things like diabetes, smoking, are they immunosuppressed due to um, other past medical history? Then other things to bear in mind is the, is the inoculation. What type of animal has bitten the patient? Where was the environment within which they sustained the injuries that have led to the infection? Appropriately timed intervention is really important. We know that the longer that we wait until we do an initial debridement, the more bacterial load there will be there. But sometimes waiting another six hours in a patient who's well, so that an awake patient can perform a much more thorough, rigorous debridement is often health. So what do we do after the first debridement? it's really important to remember that the first debridement is the best debridement. And what we often find, certainly in the UK, is that at the bottom of the um, operation note, 
The surgeon writes, second look in two days. And then another surgeon comes along in a couple of days and has another look inside the wound and gives it a little wash. And then they go back for a third look in four days and sometimes even a fourth look in six days. I have issues with this. We have to, have to, have to remember that the first deprivement is the best deprivement. And I personally feel it's a responsibility of the surgeon undertaking that first deprivement to plan definitive treatment for the patient. Saying we'll have a second look is a very passive way of managing a patient. We need to be more active and robust with these patients. So we plan definitive treatment. Now we may not be able to deliver that definitive treatment at the next operation, but we've at least planned it. And we've advised the surgeon coming on after us that if, we've, if one finds these issues within the wound, then do this. But if the wound is clear, then I think this should happen. So we're able to guide ongoing surgery and have a more sustained level of care for a patient. So when we talk about a thorough debridement, what do we actually mean? Well, we mean the removal of infected, dead, non-viable tissue, so we can leave a healthy bed for healing to occur, but also so that we can um, allow antibiotics to perfuse into the area. This is a patient who was operated on very nicely by one of my colleagues. The patient had punched somebody in the face and had sustained this injury to their metacarpal. It was plated beautifully, but they came back at two weeks with swelling and infection. And this piece of bone here was dead. There was no soft tissues attached to it. So we took it out. I filled up the cavity. I was able to re retain the plate and the patient went on to union. But the lesson here is sometimes we do need to take out dead bone that looks important. It's unlikely to do well if it stays in the body. Diagnostic sampling is really important. And the key here is the diagnostic part. What we're trying to do is to make our microbiologists job as easy as possible. So whilst the PJI world, the periprosthetic joint infection world, they have this um, guidance that you should send five or six samples to the lab and you should send one for histopathology so that we can really accurately diagnose these grumbling low-grade infections. It's much more difficult in the um, context of a hand osteomyelitis. In the wrist, you can often get five good samples, but in the hand, with there being less volume of infection, it's more difficult. So I try to concentrate on giving them quality tissue. And by that, I mean tissue, which I'm pretty confident has got an infection in it. I don't like to take swabs of wounds. I think that the colonization of the bacteria makes the microbiologist's job more difficult. You're more likely to have bacteria that's not actually relevant to what's going on deep inside the uh, patient's body. So try to take deep quality samples. We have these sampling trays in Oxford. So we have separate trays with clean materials on that we can use. So as soon as we think that we can see something that might be infected that we want to sample, we take fresh instruments so that this reduces the risk of contaminated instruments causing an issue with the sampling. Dead space is something that's often overlooked. The first operation that a lot of us have done as surgeons is to, is to drain an abscess. And one of the key parts of that is packing the abscess with ribbon gauze so that you don't allow the, the pus to reaccumulate. And we often forget that in the context of bone infection. I think this is a good illustrative case to talk about how we, we use dead space management in different ways in the hand and the wrist. This is a gentleman who had a non-union of his scaphoid grafted and he developed a post-surgical infection. And it became apparent that the scaphoid wasn't going to be um, alive and it needed to be uh, debrided and removed. So we've got two areas of dead space in this patient. We've got the red area, which is the graft site in the distal radius, which is just a cavity. And then we've got the blue area of the scaphoid. Now, if we leave that dead space open, it could cause a problem with recurrence of infection, but the risk could also migrate and that could make the definitive treatment more difficult. So I chose two different types of dead space management for this gentleman. For the radius, we filled him up with an antibiotic eluting bone filler 
and for the scaphoid, we used normal arthroplasty cement. So we've chosen two different methods of managing the same individual's different types of dead space. So here is the, the what we use is cement, and this is a, a bone filler, which also allows antibiotic to be delivered directly to the area you're depriving. So you can see here that it's a bit like toothpaste. We squeeze it into the wound and it fills up cavities nicely, but it doesn't solidify in the way that arthroplasty cement does. So for the defect where the scaphoid came from, I used a simple block of arthroplasty cement to stop the wrist collapsing radially. And we then need to think about how we're going to cover the soft tissues. Should we be covering all of them in, a, in an acute infection? Maybe not, but we need to plan and think about what soft tissue cover we're likely to need. Once we've done a thorough debridement, we need to start thinking about skeletal stability. This gentleman had a segmental defect in his metacarpal. And as I was debriding, as it became apparent that he was going to end up with a segmental defect, I put the plates on first. So I plated him, I then took the plate off, finished my debridement, and then put the plate back on. So it meant that I was able to restore his length, alignment, and rotation, and I wasn't left with a difficult fixation with a big hole. And only now do we talk about antibiotics. Osteomyelitis is a surgical problem. Antibiotics are the cherry on the cake. They're what we use to try to improve our surgery. So this patient had local antibiotics inserted into those, into those defects. So this is a gentamicin cerement, which will elute into the area and give good local antibiotic cover. This means often that we can reduce the duration of systemic antibiotics. Appropriate antibiotic use is becoming more important. We're seeing more drug resistance and we're seeing more of these superbugs occur. So it's important that we as surgeons take on board the fact that we have experts who understand antibiotics much better than we do, and we should use their expertise. This is a, an important paper. This demonstrates non-superiority uh, of uh, intravenous antibiotics versus oral. So the patient's outcomes in both the oral and the intravenous arms were the same, but the oral patients were better able to adhere to their treatment regime and had fewer complications. So this demonstrates that if you are able to culture a bacteria which is susceptible to an appropriate oral antibiotic, it is very reasonable to use an oral antibiotic rather than six weeks of intravenous antibiotics. The next study that we're recruiting to at the moment is called Solario. So this is looking at whether we can reduce the duration of antibiotics. If we're able to use a, a local antibiotic um, filler within the surgery, can we reduce the duration of systemic antibiotics that we deliver? This is undergoing the recruitment at the moment and hopefully we'll finish fairly soon. So whilst I've been in practice, what I've noticed is that despite the very poor data in the literature regarding hand and wrist osteomyelitis, certainly in comparison to the long bone literature, if you use all of the same principles, so if you undertake a thorough debridement, if you sample well and you fill dead space and you use antibiotics appropriately and you use antibiotics that are, that are bespoke to your bacteria, you can get really good outcomes for your patients. That said, it's really important to remember that osteomyelitis is a surgical problem and that you won't be able to treat osteomyelitis well if you don't deprive these patients well. But in order for us to achieve good results for patients, we need a team. And I think at a bare minimum, that is an orthopedic surgeon, a plastic surgeon, and a microbiologist or an infectious diseases physician. I'll briefly talk through our series of uh, hand and wrist osteomyelitis patients. And I have to thank Catherine Brown for pulling all of this data together. She's done a, a really good job keeping a uh, handle on this cohort. So we looked at our um, case series uh, over six years and she noted down where the osteomyelitis was, 
what organisms we'd been able to grow, whether there was any metal work in situ, the number of procedures these patients had, duration of antibiotic therapy, how we'd managed dead space, and whether we'd been able to clear infection and treat patients successfully. But I had two main questions, and one, is it, is it reasonable to convert patients to oral antibiotics in the context of the hand and the wrist? We have the benefit of this organ that has very, very good blood supply. So maybe it is safe to convert patients early. And then finally, there was good evidence in the literature that the antibiotic eluting bone filler was safe in the long bones, but there was nothing in the literature saying that it was okay to use in the wrist and the hand. So we had um, 34 patients. We're now up to um, 45, um, but their follow-up isn't long enough. And you can see that there is a very varied picture here. 14 patients had phalangeal osteomyelitis, seven patients had osteomyelitis in the metacarpal, but a lot of patients had carpus or distal forearm osteomyelitis. Three patients had had scaphoid fixations and three patients for post-total wrist arthroplasty which I think is sobering given the increase in wrist arthroplasty cases that are going to be happening in the developed world. We looked at our cernium matter staging, and as you'd expect, the majority were um, type uh, three and type B hosts. Organisms wise, as you would expect, the majority were Staphylococcus aureus, but we did see a reasonable proportion of polymicrobial disease. And this is particularly worrying in the context of um, superbug and resistance occurring. We then looked at our antibiotics and the vast majority of patients were converted to oral antibiotics once a uh, microbiological diagnosis had been uh, established. 26 of the patients had associated metal work. This is important because we know that metalwork tends to have a higher incidence of polymicrobial disease and is therefore more difficult to treat. Our average follow-up is 36 months. And so far, we've only needed one free fibula and one uh, free tissue uh, transfer for coverage. Osteomyelitis was eradicated in all of the cases. 31 patients had cement to their dead space. We only had one case of wound ooze. One of the things that comes out in the literature is that when you use cerement, you can often get prolonged wound ooze as the cerement dissolves. This isn't worrying because what's coming through the wound is basically gentamicin loaded liquid, but it can be worrying the first time that you see it. I think a key part of managing this is to make sure you've got a nice soft tissue cover over the area that you've used the cerement before you think about closing the skin. 30 out of the 34 patients were treated with oral antibiotics. I think this is really important for patients. Um, if we can get patients off IV antibiotics and all the issues associated with um, intravenous cannulae, then that's a positive thing. And our average antibiotic duration was 29 days. That's slightly skewed by one gentleman who was difficult to um, get eradication on and he had uh, a several month uh, course. So in summary of our cases, culture-driven uh, oral antibiotics reliably treat hand and wrist bone infection. The benefits of reduced hospital stay and the reduced complication profile of using oral antibiotics is pretty evident. And we were able to demonstrate that locally delivered antibiotic is safe in the hand and wrist and likely contributes to eradication of osteomyelitis. But that said, there's still no substitute for a thorough, well-executed debridement. So I'll talk through a couple of cases. So the first case is the, is the gentleman that you've already seen a picture of. So he had a, a, a vascularized bone graft um, fixed with K wires that were left out through the skin for eight weeks. And at eight weeks, he presented with what was described as a pin site infection. He had pus coming out through the wire sites and the wires were taken out and he was given empirical colomoxiclav augmentin. At 10 weeks post-op, the wrist was swollen and sore and he was taken back to the theatre and he was deprived. The Palmer approach was reopened. They sampled Staphylococcus aureus. 
and he was prescribed a four-week course of fluoxetine and erythromycin. At um, four weeks after this, he came back to the clinic. He had an ultrasound scan because the wrist was still swollen and synovitis was diagnosed and he was converted back to augmenting. At 16 weeks post-surgery, he was referred to me, the wrist stiff, swollen and very sore. So I'm sat with a gentleman opposite me in clinic who's asking me, what, what should we do now? And this is something that's difficult to often convey to patients, but what we're going to do is to stop the antibiotics. It's really important that when you take patients to theatre, particularly with chronic bone infection, that they have an antibiotic holiday. This means that you're much more likely to get accurate diagnosis and accurate microbiological uh, treatment because there's no antibiotics on board. So we stopped his antibiotic and we planned to debride him and sample him. So we reopened both the front and the back of the wrist, took out all of the dead bone and filled the dead space appropriately and took lots of samples. The criticism and potential area for improvement that I would make is that when the Palmer approach had been reopened, there'd been no formal washout of the mid-carpal joint. So I think that the issue had been that whilst the radiocarpal joint had been washed out, the mid-carpal joint had been neglected. And this had meant that the, uh, the bacteria were able to reside there and continue to replicate. So from uh, my debridement surgery, he grows MSSA and he's prescribed six weeks of oral doxycycline. I review him at eight weeks. And this is important because I don't want to see him at six weeks just as he's stopping his doxycycline. I want to see him two weeks afterwards. It's important that he's able to have two weeks off antibiotics so we get a more accurate clinical picture when I see him in clinic. So at eight weeks, the wrist is quiet. There's no signs of residual infection. So he has his definitive treatment two weeks later. So he goes on to have a wrist fusion. What we do at the time of that second surgery is that we resample him in exactly the same meticulous manner as we did the first time that we debrided him. He has a short course of empirical antibiotics whilst we're waiting for those samples to come back. And as soon as those samples come back negative, we stop his antibiotics. So around his second surgery with me, he had a three-day course of intravenous antibiotics. I think the points to take away from this case is that the first deprivement is really important. It's, it's easy to neglect the mid-carpal joint. This is the gentleman's capitate. And what we should do is treat antibiotics with respect. There was no obvious documentation that microbiology had been involved in the decision-making process around this gentleman's antibiotic therapy. The second case um, is of a 72-year-old lady who in 2010 fell over, uh, sustained a distal radius fracture and was fixed. The notes, the notes are then a little bit sketchy, but the next, um, next notes we can find are in 2015. And in the five-year interim, she's had both a total wrist replacement and uh, ulnar head replacement. Whilst these look loose, she's reasonably well symptomatically controlled until 2019, when she starts to get lots of pain in the wrist. So she presents um, to another institution and the implants are removed and a cement spacer is put in, but they're not able to close the on the side. So she has a VAC treatment for around three to four months and then presents to our open institute, our institution with this open wound over the ulna. So I take it to theatre and this is what we find. So we go through the skin, the extensor tendons are all matted into one lump of scar tissue. And as I dissect down and start the debridement, we find all of this black stuff. So this debridement takes a very, very long time. We take the uh, cement out and we send it off to the lab. 
we take all of this tissue out as best as we can. And this is the debridement at the end of about two hours. And all the way through the operation, I was wondering what on earth this black stuff was because it didn't really look consistent with metallosis. And halfway through the operation, I remembered her x-ray. And her x-ray demonstrates that you shouldn't put pyrocarbon implants next to metal implants because the pyrocarbon on the head had been rubbing on the metal of the total wrist replacement. And the black material that you could see on the pictures was like the fine shavings that you get at the bottom of the pencil sharpener. So it was quite difficult to uh, get out and was the reason why the blades were becoming blunt so quickly. Obviously from, his, uh, from her first deprivement, we'd um, had to take quite a bit of uh, bone away. And one of the things that um, we can do is we can send the cement or implants away and we can do something called sonication. So this is a, a plate that we're sending off to the lab and what they do is they um, put it into a water bath, they pass ultrasound waves through the water bath, and what they're able to do is to break the biofilm off implants, and this gives reasonable um, samples. So we routinely do this for any metal where we take out. We send it off to the lab and see if they can break the biofilm off and um, provide us with a microbiological diagnosis. So this is what she grew. Um, the microbiologists suggested um, that she start with vancomycin and uh, to penem, but then due to issues of um, tolerance, they converted her to linezolid and ciprofloxacin and felt that a six week course was probably appropriate. I'll be honest, I don't really understand what all of these different bacteria are and what they do. And that's why we have microbiologists. So I saw her at two weeks. And whilst her dorsal wound had healed, the ulnar wound still wasn't looking very healthy. And at this point, I had to accept that maybe I hadn't done a debridement that was good enough. So she went back to theatre. And unfortunately, I'd missed an area of um, pyrocarbon deposition that was travelling up her extensor carpi ulnaris. So following a second debridement, we sent more samples. This is what we grew the first time. This is what we've now grown again. So it's at this point where it's really important that the relationship with the microbiologist is robust. We um, started off with cotrimoxazole and linezolid, and at two weeks post second debridement, the wound had healed nicely, and she was finding that linezolid difficult to tolerate. So the decision was made to stop the linezolid and just to continue with the cotrimoxazole. This is what her post-surgical radiograph looks like. And at this point in February of 2020, we were planning to undertake a free fibula reconstruction of her wrist for her. But in the UK, COVID caught up with us in March 2020. So we went into lockdown. I speak to this lady intermittently and I spoke to her this afternoon. Her wounds remain healed. Her wrist function whilst not great is tolerable. She's now 82. And I've agreed to see her again in clinic over the next couple of months just to have a chat with her and see whether she'd like to consider um, a, a wrist fusion. But what this demonstrates is that with a thorough debridement, we're able to treat patients well, not necessarily in the way that the textbooks would say, but she's had closed wounds now for three years. And what this demonstrates is that if we follow the same principles of managing bone infection that I outlined at the beginning of the talk, we're able to deliver effective surgery, which improves patient's quality of life in, an, in a robust manner. So because we've undertaken these principles well, we're able to achieve good results. I think my take home messages are that the first debridement is really important and it's very much a surgical problem. You cannot lay this at the microbiologist's door. If the osteomyelitis comes back, it's because it wasn't debrided well enough. Be assertive with infection. Don't let the sun set on it, but plan it well and really engage with your microbiologists. You won't regret it. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Nicolas, for really great talk. Very interesting. And uh, I noted a few tips and tricks for myself. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, some questions, Nick. Yeah. So we take the last one first. Um, how much do you wash with saline? And the other thing that I would put in um, is uh you shouldn't you? yeah go on then um so my kind of number of choice is three liters and that's predominantly for the wrists um i think that you just need to keep washing it until you think it's clean and i think three liters is about right for the wrists if you're if you're washing out a you know a paranicia with some dead bone that you've debrided then you obviously don't need three liters but um you just want to give it a really really good wash the issues with pulse lavage are that what it can do is it can propagate tissues along fascial planes so um i can honestly say i have never used it in a case um with osteomyelitis the only time i've ever used it is to make a femoral canal clean before you put cement in it um for a hip replacement but i, I I've never used it in the context of acute or chronic osteomyelitis. The, the other thing is a number of people have said you should debride first and wash after. So you take the gross contamination out and then wash. Is that? Yeah. So what I do is, is that I cut everything out. If you wash it before you cut it, you won't be able to sample it well enough. So cut everything out. And what you should be, doing with the lavage is trying to wash out the last three bacteria that you've not been able to get so it's it's cut it out <laughs> then give it a rinse and then think about how you need to reconstruct the defects or the problems that you've been left with um another um thing is in terms of numbers of samples what people think of contamination in terms of contamination in theater but there is always the risk of contamination in the lab, isn't it? In that the labs are a pretty dirty place. And yeah. one of the reasons they re need a number of samples is that if they grow something on one sample, it could be that it was introduced in the lab. Whereas if you get it in two, uh, it, it's probable. If you get it in three, it's almost certain, isn't it? If it's the same bug. It is. It can be so. I think I've got control over contamination in the operating theatre. So it's my job to give them the samples in as good a condition as possible. So I see that as my responsibility. The reason for the multiple is so that one, it gives them enough tissue so that if they've got something which is resistant to multiple bacteria, it means they've got more tissue to then work out sensitivities. But also it means that if, if something spurious does crop up in one, then you, and to be honest, often they, they, they'll be able to tell you, and I have this rule of thumb that if I've never heard of it, it's probably a contaminant. But the microbiologist will say to you, oh, this, is, this is a contaminant. But if it's in one out of five, it's almost definite it is. And the reason that's important is you then probably don't need to find an antibiotic to treat that with. So uh, next question from Rasmus uh, Jorgensen is, um, how long do you keep patients on IV after debridement and cerement? And when do you go to oral antibiotics? I mean, presumably part of the oral antibiotics is bioavailability. So if you have an oral option that has the same bioavailability orally as it does IV, then you yeah. can switch earlier. But something like flu cloxacillin, the, the, the bioavailability is only about 30%. Yeah. So, so our protocol is that patients with osteomyelitis get vancomycin and meropenem as soon as samples have been taken in theatre, and they continue that until we've got an answer to what their bacteria is. And often that's 48 hours. So if we grow something at 48 hours that we're confident can be treated with an appropriate oral antibiotic we'll just start that as soon as we've got that data sometimes you need a little bit longer um, 
And sometimes what we'll do is stop the meropenem first while we're waiting for sensitivities to come back. The, the issue over prophylactic antibiotics is that we've, we've looked at our data over, I think Maria looked at it over a 10 year period. And we found that that was the best uh, prophylactic regimen for our demographic of bacteria. And the prophylaxis should be relevant to your local institution. Not just what you grow, but also the, the diagnostic equipment that you, you have available. So it, it's not right to say everywhere in the world should be using vancomycin and meropenem. It should be local to, to what your hospital needs. So uh, Volodymyr, has our stabilization in osteomyelitis, do you always perform internal fixation or do you use external fixation? I think the other thing is in the context of conflict injuries, wires with cement as a spacer um, with further wires, they're quite a good way of keeping things stable until uh, you, you, you're confident to start cover. Do you want to take that a bit further? So I think it depends on how confident you are that you've got it clean. So for instance, the, the scaphoid guy, um, because he'd had previous debridements, I wasn't confident that he was clean. So he got spaces. I was happy that his wrist was stable enough not to need a external fixator or even a, a bridging plate. So he just stayed in a plaster for six weeks and we then went from there. A couple of the patients that I've done with uh, wrist osteomyelitis that have had bigger defects, um, uh, two of them have had external fixators. One of them uh, didn't tolerate it particularly well and the pin sites became all horrible. Um, so we converted her early based on the fact that she'd grown a susceptible bacteria so I was happy that I would be able to suppress that if there was any there to get her out to union and then take metal work out. One patient, the other patient had the external fixator, tolerated it really well for two months. But as we were about to do a free fibula for her, we went into our second lockdown. So she was another one that we weren't able to give surgery to at the correct time. And by this point, she'd grown tired of the um, of the external fixator. So for her, what I agreed to do um, was to, well, we did two things. So this is why it's important to have a really good plastic surgeon. So she'd got um, an area over the back of the wrist that um, the skin wasn't great. So the plan had been to do a fibula with a skin paddle so that we could do both things at once. When it became apparent that we weren't gonna be allowed to use a microscope, what we agreed to do take the external fixator off, read it rider, put a bridging plate on so she'd got covered wounds and she'd not got scaffolding hanging off her wrist. And what, um, what Paul Critchley did, which I thought was pretty clever, was he did a becker flap for her. So he swung her becker flap round to give her better soft tissue coverage on the back. And what that meant was that when we came back to do her free fibula, she didn't need a skin paddle. So the operation was much more straightforward. So, in short, what we're trying to achieve is, is stability in with as little metal work, or let me rephrase that, with as little um, foreign bodies that can potentially create biofilm as possible. So the nice thing about using cement spaces is that you can put antibiotic into them. And whilst they're sitting there, you can be a looting antibiotic into the soft tissues for probably two to three months. When you look at uh, antibiotic elution from cement, it's very variable on lots of things. The porosity of the cement that you've used, the amount of antibiotic that you've put into the cement, but also if you add um, different types of antibiotics, you see this synergistic effect. So if you add gentamicin and vancomycin, you tend to get um, bigger concentrations of each antibiotic eluted into the soft tissues. So, so there are things with with cement that are beneficial rather than putting big pieces of metal in so one of the things that came out of mike cragan's talk over the birmingham experience over two conflicts a number of years apart was that 
uh, in the later series where patients were evacuated early, they were more aggressive with their first debridement. They were confident um, within a week or so that they had got the wound clean um, and they could get good soft tissue cover. They had no infections with internal fixation. Yeah. But I think if you're not confident it's clean, if there's been a long delay, if you can't get really good soft tissue cover, then you have to be much more careful with internal fixation. Would you support that? <clears throat> yeah, so there's a reasonable number of patients that will do single stage osteomyelitis reconstructions on. Um, and Martin McNally's just published the medium terms of those single stage reconstructions, um, predominantly in long bones. But, you know, certainly I've, I've treated a number of things like dog bites that have pussed out early with fractures. And as long as you are entirely happy that it's clean, you, a lot of the, I think that the use of local antibiotic eluting filler is really helpful because what it does is it gives you big concentrations of antibiotic right to where the bacteria are. And it, it's a much better way of treating people than just giving them systemic antibiotics. So for a lot of patients, I'm happy to put metal work in. Um, I'm happy to um, do that as long as I've got soft tissue cover. I, I wouldn't put plates on and then put a vac pump on or something like that. Mm -hmm. they, they've got to have, and when, when I say soft tissue cover, I mean proper robust, either primary skin closure or, or a decent okay. tissue yeah. cover. I mean, the other thing is if you're going to put fixation in a, something that has potential to be infected it has to be stable yeah you can't leave bits of dead bone uh and locking screws can be quite useful for that in, in that the stability is, is greater particularly if you've got uh defects um, i think i think i think there's also reasonable merit sometimes in suppressing patients out to union so mm -hmm. you know if, if you get somebody back who looks like they've got an early wound infection but the fixation looks reasonable you know i've taken patients back given the plate a really good scrub so the guy um who had the metacarpal fracture he's a good example of that he came back with pus coming out of his wound so i just reopened his wound gave it all a good wash took everything out that was dead i scrubbed his plate to make sure that there was no residual biofilm on there and washed all of that off closed them up and then deliberately suppressed into union. And as soon as he got union, we stopped his antibiotics and just watched the wound and, and he didn't have any recurrence. But if at that point they do, you can just take the plate out and you're then treating an osteomyelitis. You're not treating an infected non-union, which is more difficult. So 1902, Tapax asked a question that I won't dare to embark upon. So while uh, Andre's finding that, uh, Pierre Luigi asked about buried or non buried K wires. Um, so that's that is a, that's a really interesting question. And I, I honestly think, and I know that there's a trial going on at the moment, I honestly think that it's really difficult to answer that question with the literature. We see such heterogeneity of problems in the hand that it's difficult to answer the question. And because you, you know, proximal phalanx fractures get wires, Bennett's fractures get wires, okay? So you've wired a bone, but you've also passed a wire through a joint when you come to a Bennett's fracture. So you've got more movement across that wire. Some, so uh, all I can do is tell you what I do. And my theory is that if it's going across a joint, it should probably be buried. So my Bennett's wires get buried. If it is going to be in longer than four weeks, it should probably be buried. So they're the two things that I bury, the ones that are going to be in a long time and the ones that go across a joint. If they're going to be in three, four weeks, I think it's perfectly fine to leave them out and then just to pull them in clinic. Um, but there is no evidence to support what I do. You can find evidence in the literature for whatever you, whichever way you want to look after it. So I completely agree with you. And I think particularly if you're going to leave wires out, um, you should you should try and stop it moving. 
I think you've got wires poking through the skin and the skin's moving, you really take a big risk. Um, and you can create awful problems. I think part of the problem is, is that the vast majority of us, not the vast majority, a significant proportion of us are trained to KY wrists, the KY distal radiuses. And we then translate that into the hand. And, it, and, it's, and it's different. When you KY a wrist, you stick it in a plaster, it doesn't move. It's a much easier KY operation than the majority of the ones that are in the hand. And the whole thing is much more stable. So I think that we have to be a little bit more careful than just saying because you can do it for the distal radius, you can do it in the hand. And presumably where people are K-wiring is a temporary thing. So they do a first debridement of a, a, a wound with composite loss. They put some wires in just to hold everything out to length and stabilise it with a view to going back a couple of times within a week, then leaving them out is fine because you're going to do something more with them uh, in the first couple of weeks. But what you've described there is a planned pathway. And the issue comes when the pathway isn't planned. And, you know, what you will write in your operation is if any of these wires look not good, they need to be pulled and either changed or a different strategy needs to be thought of. The, the, the issues happen when, you know, you get, with no disrespect to junior surgeons, a junior surgeon going back in, normally at the end of the list after the supervisor's gone home, when they give it a quick, quick rinse, stick a bandage on, and then make it somebody else's problem 48 hours later. Andre, have you got something for us? Uh, yeah, we have a question in Ukrainian. One question about the intra-arterial uh, injection of antibiotics. Do you use it? Do you know something about it? Um, I'm unaware of intra-arterial injection of antibiotics. I have no experience in that. Okay. Uh, also, we have a question uh, about uh, some wound care and physical therapy after uh, the debridement. Uh, do you do you close the wound after the debridement uh, the first, or you wait uh, for the end and then close the wound? And uh, uh, what about wound care during all this time? Do you allow to move or just immobilize and other? So for chronic patients, my aim is to always have soft tissue cover. So that's planned surgery. So if I think that I'm going to need somebody to help me close the wound and need to manoeuvre tissue around, then I'll make sure that I've either got a plan of how to do that from somebody who does it a lot or that they're, they're available to do that. For the acute patients, it depends very much on the quality of the deprivement that I think I have and how long I think it's been going on for. So if you've got somebody who's, let's, choose the example of something like a fight bite. If they come in, the wound's a bit red and there's just the tiniest bead of pus and you open it and the rest of it's pretty pristine, then I think that it's probably reasonable for you to close that whole thing because you can be confident you've deprived it, you can be confident that you've given them antibiotics, but what they need to have is robust advice on what to do if, if it starts to become red, hot or swollen. And I'll routinely see those patients two to three days after their operation anyway, just to double check it. If you've got a fight bite that's now 36 hours old and the whole hand is red and there's pus everywhere, then I wouldn't close it. I would probably close my surgical extensions, but I would leave the lacerated area open to allow drainage. And those patients in our institution would be staying in hospital and would be looked at it two days anyway. So I think that there, there is no right answer. <clears throat> There's no right answer as to whether you should or should not close something. It, it comes down to clinical judgment. But what you can control is making sure that you take ownership of that patient and seeing them at an appropriate time point so that if anything isn't right, you can intervene and you can be assertive. I, I think if you can excise the skin edges, remove any dead fat, and end up with a wound that looks like a surgical wound, 
then it's reasonable to consider closing it in many circumstances. But if the wound edges are red, the fat doesn't look very healthy, and you put stitches in, it it's falls a disaster. Out. Yeah, Luigi, any thoughts or questions? Yes, I, I wrote it. Uh, I For soft tissue, I think that the, the key is to close after the debridement with very well vascularized tissue. If you cannot do that, uh, is, you have to reach this goal. So you can wait someone to do that, but you cannot leave open uh, a wound uh, because bacteria arrive from the hospital in the wound and not <laughs> in another way. So what I want to ask, so thank very much, Nick. I learned a lot, thank you. I would like to ask you if you do a, a washout from the antibiotics, from the first step and the second one. So how long do you keep uh, the cement, the spacer, and if you do a washout for some weeks before the second operation? So unless there is clinical evidence of recurrent infection, I wouldn't do anything. So for the two patients that I presented at the end, the only reason the second patient went back was because there was obvious the ongoing infection and an open wound. If her tissues had looked pristine, I wouldn't have taken her back to theatre. And like with the third chap, um, we closed him up. I didn't look at him. I didn't look at him for two weeks. Didn't take his plaster off, didn't look at his wound for two weeks. He knew what to look out for, um, but he came, he came back at two weeks. He had a new plaster put on, and then I saw him again at six weeks. Uh, may, may I ask you for the definitive reconstruction? So when you put a cement, you give the antibiotics, you wait, then you, you, you have a washout before the definitive reconstruction? No, so I would I take them back to their definitive reconstruction at, let's say, eight weeks. And what I do with, yeah, with the same antibiotics that they are going on. So we when used to have, stop when they have their <laughs> when antibiotic. They have, when they have their first deprivement, they're given broad spectrum intravenous antibiotics. And once we have those samples back, they're converted onto an antibiotic that's suitable for their bacteria. Okay. So let's say we decide to treat the, anti, the, the bacteria for six weeks. So they'll come back and they'll see me eight weeks after their initial operation so that they've had two weeks with no antibiotics so i can then look at their wound and if their wound is fine then we will plan for definitive treatment okay. if the wound isn't fine then we would plan for redebridement potentially do definitive treatment depending on what we find but maybe temporize for a little bit longer and new samples and yeah yeah it, it, even at the definitive treatment you ha i take new samples so you know almost the worst case scenario is you get in it looks fine you take samples you fuse a wrist and then you grow bacteria so it's important then that you treat that bacteria appropriately so i can suppress that patient out until their wrist fuses and we can then get the biofilm and the metal work out, and we can then finesse the treatment of the osteomyelitis. In the com in the context of a, an acute military injury, though, debridement, sampling, washout, stabilization, manage the dead space, go back at forty-eight to seventy-two hours. So I don't have any. Re-debride if required, or a, well, a, a, a contaminated wound. So Re-debride, and, and at that point, you can plan whether you think it's reasonable at that stage to uh, what what you're going to reconstruct. Whether you you stabilize and put soft tissue cover, or or what or, or what you do. But in the context of a, a military injury, you wouldn't close it after the first one. And no wait six weeks and then and then so you presumably always leave it open and then at your second operation that's when 
So for the gross contaminants, what, what you're looking to do is to plan your definitive treatment early. So what you need to be able to deliver at your second operation at 48 hours is you want to be able to provide skeletal stability and robust vascularized soft tissue cover. Because if you don't do either of those things well enough, you probably will get a recurrence. If it's not stable, the bone ends will be moving and it'll reduce the perfusion. So you won't be able to get antibiotics to where they need to be. If you've not got a vascularized uh, soft tissue cover, then you're exposing your implant to the elements, whether you think you are or not. So that's why it's important that these patients get a multidisciplinary approach because what you, the other thing is, is that as orthopedic surgeons, the danger that we have is, is that we get halfway through a deprivement and we start to worry about how we're going to close skin or move skin around. And that's the worst position to be in. Don't, don't even think about it. It's much better that you do a robust deprivement than compromise your deprivement because you're worried about how a plastic surgeon is going to feel because you've left them a big hole. Is the same that in tumor <laughs> safe? So, um, new question from Volodymyr: Indications for amputation in osteomyelitis and sepsis. So the the point of treating osteomyelitis is that you you want to preserve global hand function. So if it becomes apparent that treating a digit for osteomyelitis is going to compromise the rest of the hand then that's probably a good reason to lose the digit. Because what you don't want is, you know, a, a well-treated, non-infected finger, but the rest of the hand doesn't work. So where you th where if you think that global hand function will be better with the finger off, I think that's a reasonable thing to do. And in the context of severe sepsis, you, you just need to cut that out because you're going to save that patient's life. Di role of diabetes? So I think diabetes is difficult. Um, I think that we under, so I don't know if it's post pandemic, but I've seen more diabetic hands over the past 18 months than I've probably seen in the four years that I was a surgeon running up to it. From the couple that I've treated, I think the lessons are that you almost have to adopt a diabetic foot type approach and that that is take more off than you think you need to because you'll just end up nibbling and nibbling and nibbling and nibbling so to the diabetic ones again this probably comes down to vascularized soft tissue cover um, to make sure that you you've debrided far enough back that you've got a really nice soft tissue cover or else you'll just keep nibbling and don't close them too early so if you've got a diabetic problem, a patient with sepsis and diabetes, firstly, treat it really aggressively because I have a nasty habit of dying. Um, and secondly, don't, I would urge, don't try and do it all in one go. So be radical, amputate what you think needs to go, leave it open, go back and have another look and only start to think about closing it when it looks really healthy. Because otherwise, as you say, you you debride it and you close it and they come back and you take them back and it recurs and on and on you go until you end up, uh, uh, you, you lose more tissue than, than you need. I think the thing that I've taken is that you need to take more bone in the diabetic patients than you think you do. Um, so uh, an official question, Fesh question in that it's in bad bad English, which is the as we all know, is is the language of Fesh. So, can we load joint with K wires, or is that the uh, the same as external fixation? If that's, I don't know what exactly what the, the the thread there is, but I think in an acute complex injury, uh, a lot of K wires can be a very good way of stabilizing the skeleton, maintaining length um for the first week or two uh while while you get everything clean and make a plan uh for cover uh michael if that doesn't answer your question can you 
uh, give us a bit more I I in the chat box. Uh, and while we're doing that, um, there are two questions I want to ask you, Nick. Uh, and uh, the first is, I've always tended in bad infection to be a fan of two agents. What What's the Oxford view on that? Um, my, my Oxford view is that um, I let the microbiologist tell me what to do. Okay. And, and that, that's not being flippant. Um, yeah, I'm really lucky. Um, and they'll they'll go back through all of the old infections. They'll they'll look at all of the old samples that have come from the different institution. And a lot of the time, they'll just say, "Well, we'll start off with vancomycin and meropenem, but I, but I bet we end up needing to use this." And nine times out of ten, they're spot on. But so, so the basic thing is take samples and treat what you grow. Yeah. Um, so my second question is where you're in a situation that you've had an X fix on, um, which is always a safe solution. Uh, if at some point you want to uh, change from the X fix to do a definitive reconstruction, do you, do you take it off and leave a window? Do you drill the pins out? How, how, do, you, how do you manage the switch from external fixation to uh, internal fixation so if i'm ready to switch the majority of the time i'm i'm thinking that they're clean so i'll take the external fixator off over drill them um and then put a plate on um sample them treat them with the same amount of respect that i would do you know at their initial debridements um I, I'm, I'm not convinced there's necessarily a rationale in leaving a window between conversion from external fixates to plating. Um, and just to come back on another point on um, dual therapies, it's something that um, a lot of people kind of aren't aware of is, is that we, we go on to like the hostel system where you get a printout of what bugs have been grown. And if you're English, you get a, um, you get a bug you'll then get a list of antibiotics and S or R. And S stands for sensitive and R stands for resistant. So as an orthopedic surgeon, if you see like this paragraph of antibiotics and they've all got S's at the end of them, you're thinking, great, this is brilliant. I can use any of these and it'll all be fine. What, what the microbiologists don't tell us is, is that some of those antibiotics, some of those bacteria will have better sensitivity to some of those antibiotics and the microbiologist will be able to go through their data and for instance may say well this particular bacteria is more sensitive to clindamycin than augmentin so they have much more data than than they let us have so that's another reason to speak to them and i think the other so so when they culture they often put discs in so they know the minimal inhibitory uh, yeah. concentration and other things to consider are how well it's absorbed, how well it penetrates bone. Yeah. Um, uh, and some antibiotic combinations are synergistic. So the two together are, uh, will, uh, have a synergistic effect. Um, so uh, uh, as you say, it's best to talk to someone clever who can uh, explain things to you. But if, if you look at the pie chart of the antibiotics that we used, <clears throat> if, if I'd have been driving the antibiotic therapy, that entire pie chart would have been augmented. But because of the fact I've got microbiologists, you'll see that they, they've used things like clindamycin and cotramoxazole because of the fact that these uh, antibiotics have got really good bioavailability into bone, things like ciprofloxacin or rifampicin as well. So they're, they're good oral options with good penetration into bone. So it's these kinds of things that they're invaluable for. Yeah. So we're coming towards the end. So uh, Andre, any any thoughts or questions for Nick from you? Um, I have a different side of the coin about uh, being too much aggressive for uh, the debridement. Uh, I share my screen. Uh, 
and I show you two cases about um, gunshot injury uh, near the elbow region. So we have, uh, I, I understand that uh, there may be uh, not enough information about it, but uh, the skin is closed. In this case, uh, the skin is closed primarily. And in this case, uh, we have uh, skin, skin was closed uh, with a random abdominal flap, uh, but still we have a massive defect of the joint. Uh, in both cases, it's uh, lucky, uh, they, they was lucky in some uh, kind because they don't have any neurology deficit. Mm -hmm. Um, but but still, we have a massive uh, bone defects near the elbow joint, so it's very interesting in what to do with uh, this type of uh, type of injury. Yeah, I, th I think that's a good point. So in the upper limb, certainly bone fragments you probably can get away with leaving more than you can in the lower limb because it's better perfused. And obviously in terms of your debridement, you don't want to cut nerves and vessels out because uh, that's, yeah. uh, so, so uh, you do want to debride radically, but you also need to, uh, uh, to understand to, to... it, not over the bride. Mm. Um, Excellent. Uh, Pierre Luigi, uh, any thoughts from you? No, just thank. I learned a lot and uh, I do that. Uh, I, I, I think that the important things is to do all this with uh, in a multidisciplinary way, as uh, Nick tell us. Uh, if you have your infectivologist, like I have, uh, you are really, really, really lucky because he knows everything about antibiotics, pro and cons and side effect is important. <laughs> so really we need this. Then uh, I am lucky because I love microsurgery. So I try to do not all by myself, but I do orthopedic and plastic surgery together. So uh, I love this kind of things. And, but I learned a lot, a lot. Thank you very much. Fantastic. So, Nick, thank you very much. That was a lovely talk. And uh, your answers to the questions uh, uh, have been very helpful. Um, on behalf of uh, FESH, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Um, uh, I think that this is being videoed, so it will be available on the website if people want to go uh, back over some of the finer points. Um, the uh, We will have a, another webinar in May. Uh, I'm afraid I don't yet uh, have a speaker to, or a date to offer you, but we'll, we'll certainly let you know uh, in good time. Um, and... Uh, in the uh, in the time offered honored fashion, Slavia Ukraini, and I'll let uh, um, Andre close the meeting. Heroin Slava. Dziękuję wam wszystkim za to, że wy byli dzisiaj z nami. Dziękuję mu, jestem nadzwyczajnie dziękuję Nikolasu za а неймовірно цікаву лекцію і за цікаву дискусію в кінці лекції. Дякую, що було багато запитань, ви проявили свою активність. І нагадаю, що в цю суботу у нас, як вже традиційно склалося, вебінар з реабілітації кісті. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. Uh, that was really diamond. Uh, very interesting, very useful talk, and uh, I will look for the recording maybe once or twice. It's absolutely.
Um, you are a star. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pierre Luigi. Thank you, Jonathan, for uh, doing all this stuff, <laughs> organizing that. So, uh, I have a question for you, Jonathan. Uh, webinar in May. It uh, plans before or after the uh, congress? Probably after. I think after. After the congress, yeah, <laughs> because the too many things. So too many things. Too many things. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I understand you. So cool. Okay. Thank you a lot. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. You will remedy. Hopefully.